Mic check, mic check. Hello? I think. I think we're good to go. It's your cult boyfriend, back again, part two to my smash success of a video where I read letterbox reviews of my favorite films. The YouTube sensation returns. The cult boyfriend strikes back. Um, all right, uh, just get the preamble out of the way. This is meant to be all in good nature. Um, this is just good fun. We're just having a fun time. Don't dogpile, don't bully, and that includes me. Don't do it to me either, you bunch of fucking zealots. Don't do it to me. Again, Letterboxd is a great and terrible website where great and terrible reviewers come and leave great and terrible takes. So, I think that's all the preamble we need. Let's just dive into it. I think that this time around, we'll start with something that I think a lot of people have seen. Because I realize I have really weird takes, and there's no single person on the planet who likes the same movies I do and appreciates them uh, the same amount. Um, the fact that my channel is unsuccessful as fuck should really speak to that. <laughs> you know, which is better, disturbing behavior or The Godfather? I fucking can't tell, but I'm, I'm leaning towards um, I'm leaning towards Katie Holmes with the nose piercing. Okay, Titanic. All right, let's start it off with 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 a man named Wood. I think it's a trustworthy name. Sounds strong, sounds sturdy. I never had to knock on it. You should just leave. It doesn't get any better than this. That's peak comedy for my channel. Watched this for the first time as God intended on two VHS tapes. Do you remember? Do you remember VHS tapes? Do you remember the the, the double tape box? Do you remember the Titanic? Do you remember being a kid? Captain, the ship is sinking. Violin players. That's so sad. Alexa, play Despacito. This is the problem. All of you letterboxed uh, fucking users, listen up. This is the problem with upvoting memes. Eventually, all memes die, and then this is worse than a relic. It's not even an artifact. It just doesn't make any fucking sense, and if it does make any sense, it's just sheer fucking cringe. So, but I'm glad it's the second most popular, most insightful review on Letterboxd of one of the most famous and successful and well-known love stories of all time. Cool. Lucy. He exists now only in my memory. A few minutes ago, I had so much to say, and now it's all a cloudy haze. This movie is the only way I can seem to properly mourn my mother. All right, shit. Shit just got real. Okay, let's let's do this seriously. I think because I shove my negative feelings so deep down that I forget they exist at all. But I let my grief come back to the surface for the first time in a long time, and I needed to. This movie brings it all back. And when I was done crying over it, I started sobbing over her. It's been six years this week since I held her hand and watched her go. I think that's all I have to say. Well, Lucy, thank you so much for saying that. Thank you for sharing that. Honestly, that's that's uh, so tender, so so private, so personal, so truthful. That um, it, like honestly, it, it's affecting. Um, thank you so much uh, for for sharing this in in such a public forum. Um, I'm so sorry about your mother passing. That's always really hard. I have movies that remind me. My mom, my mom's dead as well. I have movies that remind me of her, or movies that even help me mourn for my parents. Uh, they both died in a car accident in my early 20s, I want to say. Um, I deeply appreciate reviews like this. Like, this is a great example of why Letterboxd is valuable, because people feel comfortable and safe and are skilled enough when it comes to articulation that they're able to share things like this and... Um, a whole bunch of people can kind of latch onto it and understand and, and, and empathize. And Lucy, just thank you so much for sharing this. Um, yeah, it's it's really meaningful. And oh boy, the feels, the feels, the feels are fucking real right now. Um, fuck. It's going to be hard to snap back to um, to my usual unlikable dumbass slacker self. But thank you, Lucy. Robert, ha ha, wow, fucked up if true. Okay, here's a great example of why Letterboxd is shit. I love that this in intensely personal, hypersensitive review is sandwiched between two dumbass fucking meme reviews posing 
posing as insight. Uh, you know, you know what it does? It undermines. It even trivializes Lucy's uh, Lu- Lu- Lucy's sharing, like Lucy's story. This is so fucking dumb. Whatever. My God, Lucy, I'm sorry that this review ended up in this kind of um, classification. Good God. Uh, David Ehrlich. That's a name that's familiar. I feel like David Ehrlich is a significant figure. I don't know. All life is a game of luck. Well, I see he got where he is today because of his amazing, concise insight like that. Thanks, David. Last one. Nothing has ever wrecked me like this. I repeat, no real-life event in the history of the world holds a candle to the awesome, inimitable wrecking power of this film. Um... Titanic's based on a true story. Is this a joke? Is this a joke meme? Am I just not understanding it? It's completely possible that that's the case. Uh, I'm not really that hip with with humor, bros. Not really like that cool, guys. Um, if that was a, a joke, it fucking either went over my head or it failed completely. Let's go to Gossip. Gossip's one of my favorite movies ever. Um, it's criminally undervalued. Hell, I don't even think most people have seen it or even heard of it. Gossip is one of the most brilliant postmodern masterpieces ever made. Uh, the year 2000. It's fucking gorgeous. I, I w- put it on my gravestone. Epitaph. <laughs> watch Gossip, motherfuckers. Please watch Gossip. It's so fucking beautiful. All right. So the top three reviews are all probably not great for it. Okay. Let's get into Dan Gorman. Intense late 90s, early aughts vibes here. Everyone lives in this fucking learn how to read, Zach. Everyone lives in some wildly outrageous loft in the meatpacking district. And the only thing people drink in this movie are colorful martinis. Yes. As God intended, just like that Titanic review, only it's applicable here. And why wouldn't you if you had the choice? <laughs> I mean, it's also making a comment on, on hyper-privileged people in a hyper-stylized universe of archetypes. I mean, it, it that's, duh. Almost stumbles into being very ahead of its time. Agreed. With sexual assault gossip and perceptions, but ultimately just ends up being a springboard for tawdry thrills and revenge plotting. This movie is too smart for you, Dan. I am a sucker for shitty teen thrillers from this era, though, so I got what I was looking for when I pressed play. No, 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 you didn't. No, you didn't. Uh, Gossip is one of the most sophisticated postmodern films ever made. Y- y- you need to you you need to turn on your fucking big boy brain, your big galaxy brain, if you want to interact with gossip. I, I I will not have this. I I will get mean over over gossip. Dan, Edith. So this movie is. Well, I think that, no, so it's like, hmm, awesome. I love that naturalistic articulation. It's not nauseating. It's not annoying. It's not making me so fucking stressed out I want to scream. It's perfect. I love when reviews start like that. Blame it on the foundation rattling popularity of cruel intentions and wild things. No, I refuse. But the aughts love tapping into taboos without really saying anything of substance about them, embracing a B-movie campiness with a severe case of Nietzschean cynicism, nothing like a group of friends who spread rumors only to find out that one among them may be a rumor in and of himself. How are... How is everyone watching this movie and not understanding a fucking word of it? Oh my god. Okay, let's... Let's have fun. Let's have a little workshop, a little your cult boyfriend fucking one-on-one seminar time. Gossip. What is gossip? Is gossip fun? That's the thesis. That's the question, right? What is gossip? Gossip is the narrative of the fucking universe. It's the narrative of the world, the narrative of civilizations. It's not... Gossip is historical. Rumor is fact. What is fact in a postmodern world? When deconstructed, it's nothing. It's just what has more theatrical viability. These characters here are just completely understanding that the world is made up of gossip, that gossip is the narrative of the world. And when new people enter into the fray, when new archetypes enter into the scene, they have to fit cleanly, even uh, even if that in- involves abuse, uh, sexual or physical, they are forced to play a certain role inside the overall um, rumor-ruled narrative of postmodern civilization. Um, truth is, is is a power play. Truth doesn't, it doesn't matter about um, belief or about fact. 
all that dictates truth is bad cabaret, is theatricality. If you put on a better show, then you tell the better truth. Truth does not have value. What has value is theatricality. What has value is narrative, and narrative and theatricality have way more in common with gossip than it does with um, true and perfect insight or, um, I mean, truth in general. Okay, I still have I still have a lot more of this review. Um, Okay, and without giving it all away, is probably about 20 years too early to have an actually introspective take on sexual assault. Have, have you thought that maybe the point of gossip is that it's not in, truly like introspective takes on sexual assault? It's an introspective takes on how narratives form um, classifications of, of victims in our society and, and how, how easily it is to be a rumor in, in, in and of yourself, right? You, you, you brought that up as if it was a negative towards the film. What do you think you are? What do you think your social definition is? What do you think you are in, when it comes to your, your social relations? You are a construct. You are made up of what people say about you, not necessarily of how you actually feel. If you're unable to actually express how you actually feel, then gossip will rule you, right? Right? Like you can transpose what I just said to, to studies of sexual assault. Not fucking now. <laughs> oh my god. Alright. This offensive and fun outlandishness does not work with the base material. Y yeah, it does. You're not Heathers, so stop trying. It's not even trying to be Heathers. Have you seen one fucking dark teen movie and you just assume everything is like Heathers? It's not trying to be Heathers, you perfect, misunderstood person. I'm not. It's Everything's fine. Everything's fine. These films acted as some sort of edgy romanticism of adulthood and college life for teenagers, posing the same social politics as a high school locker room. And yet, these are social politics that you have a fundamental uh, misunderstanding of. You can't comprehend it. As if we're to believe that a new girl on campus would be rumor-worthy. Hell, I barely know anyone outside of my own friend group. That's a fucking self-report. What am I supposed to do if you don't have the life experience necessary to vibe with gossip? What am I supposed to say to that? Anyway, it seems trivial to be offended by this movie. I mean, facts. Look at me. Look at me. I'm a fucking joke. I'm the laughing stock of the film community now. But can we please stop using trauma as a way to evoke sympathy? No. No, we can't. I don't think this film does that at all. If it does that, then that completely fucking um, contradicts what you said earlier. Uh, I think that it is, yeah, you're right about edgy romanticism. Edgy romanticism and sympathy over trauma is not, that's not, com those aren't compatible elements. You have to choose one. I choose edgy romanticism over sympathy for trauma. And you think that sympathy for trauma is a trivialization of trauma, I'm, I'm guessing, um, which I don't actually believe that it is, especially when we're dealing with a teen film, um, films that are uh, trying to interact with, with a certain kind of young group who may need to be shown um, the, 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 the proper etiquette, the proper, the, the necessarily proper ways to deal with trauma. By the way, gossip is not doing this. Gossip lives in a post-moralist world, motherfucker. Don't bring moralism to gossip. That's You brought up Nietzschean earlier. This is a nihilistic fucking movie. Don't try to apply morality to it. If it does something trivial that you perceive as trivial, then it's deliberate, and it's part of its philosophy. Edith, you're cool. Trust me, I'm just overpassionate, impassioned about gossip. And while we're at it, why does every collegiate have to be portrayed as a goddamn psychopath? Because they are, Edith. Because they are. The lesson here is that college taught us to effectively execute an elaborate... <sighs> Fucking learn how to read! <sighs> The lesson here is that college taught us to effectively execute an elaborate comeuppance. No entry essay required. Was that like a mic drop moment? Because fell flat. Don't listen to them. Gossip is beautiful. Don't don't ever listen to them. Gossip is fucking awesome. I love gossip. All right, let's move out of postmodernism for a second. I feel like I'm going to have a fucking heart attack if we read another one right now. Let's go to Playtime. Uh, Jacques Tati, 1967 fucking masterpiece. Mm. I love playtime. It's beautiful. And first, <laughs> no, Karsten. Let's let's do this. There can only be one. Let's let's rock, Karsten. What you got for me? I got really sad when this was over. Not in a way where I'm just saying that to say it. 
Well, I didn't. I wasn't suspicious of it until you you said that second part. Now I'm extremely sus of your emotions. I was genuinely kind of upset. I get it. I get it. But now I really don't think you were. Why did you have to reemphasize so much? For its two-hour runtime, I felt so comfortable in the world Tati created. He created an awesome world. It's fucking gnarly as fuck. Everything is so well orchestrated, and the commitment to the style is unforgiving. Just based off personal taste, I can't really say there's a better-looking film out there. I mean, I'll give you that. I ain't. I won't argue with it. Just watch the last ten minutes and get back to me. I'm so in love with this, and unlike most of what I've seen from Tati, this... I've, I have forgotten how to read since last time, guys. I am so, so mortified. Unlike most of what I've seen from Tati thus far, I'm pumped to watch it again. Yeah, fucking rules. Oh, you! not only do you have the, the most popular, you have the second most popular as well. Let's do this, Karsten. Gotta get drinks with Tati and pick at that silly little brain of his. Aw, cute. There's really not much insight at all, so there's nothing I can either disagree with or truly champion, but... It's nice reading a review from Karsten that didn't um, trigger me. Oh, next one. I don't know, man. I don't think I understood what was going on for most of the movie. It's shot with such a wide eye that I got stressed out and felt like there was too much I was supposed to be focusing on in any given shot. I don't think his shots are confusing. I think they're so like like hyper choreographed and practiced that um, like your 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 attention is fixed on exactly what Tati wants it to be focused on. I'm not sure why you would have difficulty with it. Excited to see the other Monsieur Hulot movies because it seems like a character slash stick. I would really dig, but this one just kind of left me frustrated. The choreographed slapstick bits are great and very Mr. Bean. Don't you fucking... Mr. Bean couldn't hold a candle to Hulot. Fuck no. And the whole thing is immaculately staged, though. Tativille is beautiful. Gorgeous production design, outstandingly shot. This whole thing looks like a French Norman Rockwell painting. Normandy Rockwell. I, I don't have... If it's not for you, it's not for you. Um, if you didn't like Playtime, though, I will say this. You won't like the other Monsieur Hulot films. You won't like um, Monsieur Hulot's Holiday. You won't like um, you won't like Mon Uncle. Uh, Playtime is definitely peak tatty. If you didn't enjoy Playtime, I really wouldn't try the others um just being honest nothing against you if you didn't like it it's just um it's the best uh you wouldn't like the others sorry cinema void it's like a double page spread of where's waldo but everyone is waldo whoa dude no fucking way let's do um miami vice miami vice is a uh, perfect and very um, enigmatic, kind of mysterious uh, Michael Mann masterpiece. Nadine Smith, it thunders a lot in this movie, but it never rains. Um, welcome to Florida. I mean, it rains in Florida, but we have heat lightning and shit like all the time. Um, unless that's like more a more specific uh, reference that I'm missing. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. Go visit Florida for a while. You've all heard this before. <clears throat> Once I had a fortune, it said, leave now, life is short, time is luck. Anyways, this is like, still the peak of digital photography in movies? Um, it's really good. It's really fucking good. Nothing else looks like this. This is one of the most lyrical, abstract, and oblique films to come out of Hollywood. German expressionism gone digital. German expressionism gone digital. No, no. I don't, why would you even fucking say that? Okay, <laughs> okay, another sidebar, another workshop, seminar time. German Expressionism, if it's about any one truly philosophical or emotional thing, it's a, it's a blatant rejection of an objective reality. So in like the films of Robert Vine or F.W. Murnau or even in Tim Burton films, you their depiction, their representations of of reality are so exaggerated that they're hyper stylized in a curvature in a very curved and angular and pointed sort of way it's unreal it's even close to surreal um and emotion is derived from the atmospherics but it's an emotion that like i said clearly rejects an objective reality there's nothing about miami vice ever in fact 
he's like a modernist. There's nothing about Michael Mann at all that is any that rejects objective reality at all. In fact, I think that what makes films like Miami Vice so confrontationally beautiful is that uh, it's a it's he embraces the, the 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 dirtiness and the beauty and the motion, like the physical poetry of skylines of cityscapes as they are he does maybe mess with like camera speeds and um he might play around with with colors and things of that nature but it's never it's never rejecting uh the material world it's never rejecting reality emotion is derived from from the realism of it i mean come on dude man has way more in common with rossellini than he does with caligari that's and and he doesn't have anything in common with either of them, just to be clear. But it's not German expressionism unless you wanted to just, like show off with that pole that's not even deep. Seriously, put Met put Metropolis next to Miami Vice and tell me they're at all remotely similar stylistically. But okay, sure. Of course this puzzled many when it first came out. Yeah, but not for that reason, not because it's German expressionist inspired. Man is like a silent filmmaker here. No, the fuck he isn't. Pictures tell us a story before actors do. Crazy. That's wow. Must be silent filmmaking. That's like saying Leonard Cohen isn't a lyricist because the instrumentation provide the tone before the words do. Like, no. Why why are you why are you taking this angle? Moods are denoted by shades of colors and neon. Yes. Yes. And German expressionism, silent films known for their neon. And whole pools, waves of emotions revealed by the near abstraction in the formations of a cloud. The last time we see Farrell prior to the last shot, he performs like a confused puppy. Uh, this performance has the saddest eyes in all cinema. Agreed. Yeah, that's actually pretty, pretty apt, pretty accurate, dude. Colin, that's probably probably part of his appeal. Um, he's got a lost, dirty, fucking puppy feel to him. But the last shot is still so so much more heartbreaking. Returning to work, his stride like nothing ever happened. Also, doesn't this make a great pairing with Bridges of Madison County? No. No, it doesn't. David Sims, hola, chica. Fucking insight. That's what I call that. I call that red hot fucking... Rewrite the history books, dude. We got a new theory. And then Colin Farrell is a sentient pile of cocaine with a handlebar mustache. And it is easily one of my favorite performances ever. I won't, I won't argue with that, you know? Cool, yo. It's cool with me. Let's go to Scream next. Scream, let's go to Big Daddy W. Kevin Williamson, baby. Let's see. First up, from Jay. Gail Weathers setting up her camera immediately after surviving a serial killer attack. Story time, I almost died. No clickbait, gone wrong. So fucking funny, dude. That's hilarious. Yeah, me and 7,500 other people, dude, fucking dying over here. That's the best thing that could possibly be said about Scream. That's the best part. Hell yeah, dude. This review. Look at all these spoilers. Letterbox. I'm only going to tell you this fucking once, bro. I can handle the truth. Sierra. I already knew Billy was going to be the killer because I have seen so many 15-year-old girls on Tumblr nutting over pics of him covered in blood. Yeah, it's annoying. But I did not suspect Shaggy from Scooby-Doo to be one for one goddamn minute. Consider me shook. I love Billy and Stu. They're great. They are awesome. Sydney, I was literally just almost brutally murdered last night. Ha ha, yeah, IDK, anything about that. Ha ha, it's so weird. It's reviews and no. Look at these fucking emojis. Get out of here. Billy really said, you've been acting like such a bitch since your mom died. All right, so like, I disagree with the idea of this being one of the most popular reviews, but that's fucking hilarious, dude. Good pull, Dawson. Hey, Dawson, Kevin Williamson might have a show you'd like. Check it out. Muriel, um, when he tells you the exorcist reminded him of you. Cool. I like that we have thirst posting beneath the, the review shaming that kind of posting. Wow, I got no substance there at all.
you know, one of the most influential horror films ever made, and yet Letterboxd has dick to fucking say about it. Let's go to Chunking Express. Let's get a bit more um, overtly sophisticated. Jacob, me, after California Dreamin' plays for the 400th time. Play it again, Wong. Fucking hilarious. Dirk H., I love the stupidity of holding on to what has moved on. I love the smallness of the biggest emotion we know. All right, we've got a, we've got a writer here, finally. I love the pain that doesn't seem to leave, but you know somehow it will. I love seeing love. That hit me, bro. That hit me. Brendan Michaels. I always love films about people feeling lost. It reminds me of who I am. There's this feeling of trying to find a connection to something, but there's a struggle as you don't know how to work that connection. That's what I think Wong Kar Wai pulls off so well with this film. He creates these parallel stories of people who want to connect but are too lost to do anything about it. That's what gets me too, Brendan, and I, I, I already like this review. This is a good one. I like reviews that are like hyper-personal. You don't have to write a fucking like a college fucking essay. You, you don't have to write a thesis or whatever. You don't have to write um, a dissertation. I'm not interested in that. You can just be open and honest and treat this space as a diary, but a diary where you actually provide insight, which Brendan seems to be doing here. So ups to Brendan. Good job. And uh, I agree completely. Part of what makes Chunking Express one of the most romantic films I've ever seen, same with like Lost in Translation, the, the Coppola film that was that would not exist without Chunking Express, but I honestly think Lost in Translation is just slightly better. Don't hate me. But they, they both use the same kind of postmodern romantic language. I also, I, I relate to this review. I think it would be impossible not to. We live in an ultra-modern world that isolates and alienates us from all sorts of things that should bring us warmth. We're isolated from sincerity. In fact, sincerity is a foreign kind of object. The for, uh, sincerity is objectified. So it doesn't even feel real when we're able to actually authenticate it. Um, Chunking Express, I think, perfectly um, adopts this kind of lost, uh, orphaned kind of new world. Um, I, I do feel lost as well, but Chunking Express and then reviews or reactions to it, like the one from Brendan's here, uh, really helps me know that like I'm not alone. This is the, the postmodern condition. And we're all trying to work through it in our own ways, but we keep getting more alienated from one another. This is the true work of a master, and I can already tell Wong Kar Wai will be a great director to explore in the future. I kind of adore this movie, if you haven't already realized. I realized it, and I do as well, and I appreciate, and I respect your, your review here. Wong Kar Wai is definitely a master. If you like Chunking Express, it was my first one too, you'll love his work. You really will. Um, maybe Fallen Angels or um, In the Mood for Love clearly should be the next one you check out. This is back in 2017. I sound pompous, so I'm sure you already know way more about them than I do. Uh, thanks for that review, Brandon. Thank you for sharing that. Sometimes I feel like a can of expired pineapples. No way, dude. Fuck. Yaz. Bitches be like ACAB, then rate Chunking Express 4.5 stars. Oh, okay. I was about to tear into that review, and then I saw her <laughs> that she rated it 4.5 stars, so I guess she's bitches. And, um, I mean, <laughs> that, that, that's funny. It's a good joke. It has a few layers to it. Uh, I mean, honestly, yeah, A cab, but oh, damn it. I guess I'm bitches too. Okay. Got me. You got me. All right. Let's fuck around with. Let's fuck around with Disturbing Behavior, dude. Let's do that. I love Disturbing Behavior. It's one of my favorite fucking movies ever made, dude. I will go to war, into battle. I'll get bloodied for Disturbing Behavior. Lucy, who we like a lot. Uh, she posted that 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 super um, emotional and touching review for Titanic earlier. So we know Lucy. She's a recurring character now. Welcome to the crew. This is one of the best shitty teen movies of all time, and I'm raising my rating to five stars. Do it. Do it. But you know what? Let's just remove shitty. You know? Just remove shitty. We'll reclaim it. This is what the new mastery looks like. It looks like disturbing behavior. Lucy. Oh, this was her 4.5 star rating. Okay, before she corrected herself, you know, before she made good on... on whoa, you're lucky you made that other review. And I like the other reviews more popular. Uh, than the original one, simply because she switched it to five stars. Maybe Letterboxd is based when it comes to fucking disturbing behavior. Hell yeah, guys. 
I genuinely find this movie to be endlessly entertaining every time I revisit it. The 90s vibes mixed with some truly interesting choices in music, dialogue, and even editing, and the very obvious overall corniness only makes it better. I mean, sure, I'm not going to disagree with with a super positive review of Disturbing Behavior. I'm with you, Lucy. I'm with you. Let's let's carry the torch for that fucking movie together, dude. Todd Gaines. All right. Yeah, from 2016. This is like when I was actually active on Letterboxd. Todd Gaines had a lot of reviews around, and he was actually pretty nice. I do remember talking to him a few times. Been a long time since I read one of his reviews. I remember he had like a funky kind of writing style. Um, I remember he wrote like, like a James Elroy character, if that is a reference that makes sense to you. Something ain't quite right with a certain clique of high school kids in the sleepy town of Cradle Bay. What we see isn't the complete vision from director David Nutter. And thank God it isn't. I don't like, I don't like, I like the studio. I like the hackneyed studio version. It's so much more problematic. Its implications are sadistic. Certain scenes that would have made the plot make sense are cut. I've seen many of the scenes. Whoa, dude, no way. And I would have kept a lot of them. Especially the original ending. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I hate that original ending. <laughs> Nick Stahl, I don't like his death in the original ending. Come on, dude. Him praying on an urban center is so much more fucked up. Him living and continuing to be brainwashed or whatever, it's fucking perfect. Don't. He dies and his last words are like, I guess I'll never get to meet Trent Reznor. No, fuck off. Nope, that's not good. The, the studio sometimes make correct decisions when it comes to studio movies. I know that's hard for a lot of people to realize, and, but it's true. Sorry. However, the final cut is still a damn entertaining horror flick. Agreed. The music captures the mood just right, highlighted by the flies, got you where I want you. I think that's the one that Katie Holmes was in the music video for. I think it was used as a piece of advertisement for the film, so... I mean, anything that hyperfixates on Katie Holmes is a five-star fuck fucking great shit in my book. And Harvey Danger's flagpole sit up. Yeah, it's so good in the movie. My my first video about disturbing behavior, I opened it by covering uh, Flagpole Sitta. I had so much fun. Notice how I said my first video, because I've made three videos about disturbing behavior because it's perfect. Okay, it deserves discourse. I will force discourse upon you. The fashion is so mid-90s alt-punk grunge meets Beverly Hills 90210. If this movie isn't prototype Gen X horror, what is? The Faculty. Why do I love this? Duh, Katie Holmes. Nux, bruh. I don't think I need to explain my fondness for her. But if you did, I'd read it. I'm always down for explaining my fondness of Katie Holmes. James Marsden might be 25, but he's rocking in his high school kid hero lead. Yeah, he's really good. He's really good. Super underappreciated. You want to talk about an underappreciated actor? James Marsden through and fucking through, man. The best performance, Nick Stahl absolutely kills it in the first act. Fuck, what a case of wasted potential. Nick Stahl, Gavin, is the best fucking, one of the best characters I've ever seen in, in a teen film. Oh my god, he's great. He, he's, he's, he's Mercutio, essentially. He makes such a strong impact. The film insists on him so much, and then when he's basically violent removed from us, um, for all intents and purposes, his personality has been wiped away violently uh, by the middle of the film. The film itself takes a much more tragic and horrific tone, right? And the wasted potential, I hope you're not talking about his change. I don't think you are. I think you're probably talking about the career of Nick Stahl, which, um, yeah, is a bit unfortunate. But we still like great films like um, like Disturbing Behavior and Bully. And um, I know a lot of people don't like Terminator 3, but he's actually really good in it. He 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 expresses like like the the, the troubled, self hating, um, fatalistic nature of his character circumstances of John Connor really well. People should rewatch it. If for nothing more than Nick Stahl's characterization, it's really good. He, he's very intense. Oh, and Sin City, of course, is uh, unforgettable there. So it's really not um, a terrible career. I mean, come on. He 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 left some legendary moments behind. Um, the most legendary of those being in Disturbing Behavior. Bruce Greenwood plays a real bad guy, someone you absolutely hate. We need more total ass real people horror villains. Plus, William Sadler looks crazy-eyed yet again, and he gets to go all Pink Floyd on some motherfuckers. I love William Sadler, and he's really, really cool in it. Not to mention all the Blue Ribbons kids. My favorite has to be Chug. Was he like the sexual assaulter? I would never refer to that character as a favorite. 
one of my favorite parts of the film is when Katie Holmes bashes his fucking brains in with a lead pipe. Um, a nice ode to the sex is bad theme from the 80s slasher formula. Oh, because all the kids get worked up in the wrong ways when they're aroused. You could even think deep and look at Marsden's family. What happened to a family when a child dies? What happens to the middle kid after the oldest is no longer around? Um, I think you're running a fool's errand right now, Todd. I don't think that it's really dealing with um, trauma. I think it's hyper-focusing on the ways that people will use that trauma to manipulate young people. I don't think it's actually hyper-fixating on, on the trauma itself. Why does death either make a family stronger or rip the family apart? Wait up. Did I get my hands on some of UV's strong ganja? Sometimes humor falls flat, but it's fine. Todd is trying to provide insight. Speaking of UV, now there's a puff puff pass. Now there's a puff puff never pass donor. Dude is gone the entire flick. Yeah, dude, I can't believe it's the same fucking guy from Final Destination. I can't believe it. He was cool. Bro is high as a kite. Fella is in constant munchy mode. Think Slater from Days and Confused if he was an alt runk alt runk fuck. Dude, this is going to be my last one. I, I've forgotten how to read. Think Slater from Days and Confused if he was an alt punk albino. He's my favorite character. Uh, he, he's cool. Not going to argue with that. With disturbing behavior being trimmed under 85 minutes, you run into plot holes, but that's okay. Just jump over the holes and roll with the fun. It's not perfect, but it still holds up, even if it does look its age. If you're into mind control, give this one a go. All, all those mind control fans out there, the fandom of mind control, Todd Gaines got the movie for you, dude. <laughs> it's all in good fun. I think Todd Gaines is... um. All things considered, a, 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 a decent reviewer actually considers what he writes. Anyways, I think that is where we're going to end it because oh, my throat is uh, getting tired. My yap de yap 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 needs to sit the fuck back. Um, yeah. Once again, let me reemphasize: no, uh, no dogpiling. This isn't meant to be bullying. And once again, I don't think I did. I held back an awful lot. It's all in good fun. And um, dude, I really think that's it. I don't want to drone on any further. This was fun. Okay. Goodbye. Thanks for watching. Peace. Look at my Michelle Williams shirt. I love this. I love this, dude. Michelle Williams for life.